I'm going to read through the chapter. I've done some translating work here today. And this, this is pretty close to the New American Standard Bible. But I want to read the whole chapter before we start seeking to understand it. But when I read, you know, a lot of people, when you read Scripture first, they kind of turn their mind off and think about their laundry list or whatever. <laughs> this is the time to really pay attention because this will unlock a great deal as we go through. All right. And, you know, your best friend in interpreting the Bible, I have six friends. Who, what, where, why, when, so what? <laughs> I bombard the Bible text with those questions as I go through. Try it. All right, here we go. Verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me. Now, the last time we studied in chapter 16, I brought out the fact these are talking about the seven golden censers that were used in the temple. And these were the ones that were poured out, the most horrible judgments of all time, the seven that are in chapter 16. So when we read chapter 17, this is not carrying the history forward. This is going back and explaining the main characters and main organizations that are going to produce the kind of destruction that we see in this seven-year period called the Tribulation. All right, so now this is a flashback to explain the why of some of the most awful things that are going to happen to the world in the future. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven golden censers came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great whore who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, I might point out that the ten horns are on one of the heads, not, you know, not scattered on the various ones. There are seven heads. The one that is prominent has ten horns on it, okay? The woman was clothed in purple, and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold goblet full of abominations and the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead, her name was written, a mystery. Babylon the Great, mother of whores and of abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was, is not, and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was, is not, and yet will come. Here's the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And there are also seven kingdoms. Five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when it comes, it must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not 
is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven. And he goes to destruction, or literally, he leads to destruction. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. These will wage war against the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. And he said to me, The waters which you saw, where the harlot sits, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. The ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. And the woman, I have this in my notes introduced, and the whore is, the woman whom you saw is the great city which is reigning over the kings of the earth. Did you get some questions I read through? I hope you did, because that's the way you learn. All right, let's go back and let's look at this more analytically. Obviously, these are figures of speech. They're symbols that are used in the first part, as in many parts of the book of Revelation. But did you note that the angel told John, here is the mind that has wisdom. That was the plot point. That was where the chapter turned because he was introducing the fact that he was going to explain the meaning of all of those figures used in the beginning of the chapter. And he does. Now, See, the book of Revelation really isn't that difficult to interpret. I don't know why it is difficult for many people to interpret, but most people just fail to realize that the book of Revelation explains itself. And if the figures of speech used here are not explained in the immediate context, they're explained somewhere else in the Bible. All you have to do is take concordance and start going through and tracking these words and the Bible itself will explain those symbols and the Holy Spirit used John to write this book in such a way that the Bible would be its own encyclopedia for it the Bible itself is the encyclopedia for the book of Revelation now we can see as we start off here that there are two major items in this chapter that are explained. And you can see they are the most important. What are the two major items in this chapter? What do you think? All right, the harlot and the beast. You got it. The harlot and the beast. Now, there are many factors to the harlot and to the beast, but the two main driving forces that are explained here are the harlot and the beast. Okay. So when it says, one of the seven angels who had the seven golden censers came and spoke with me saying, come here and I will show you the judgment of the great whore who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. Now, we have to take a good look at this woman. He said that he was going to talk about her, but in verse 3 it says, 
he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And wilderness is used in a figurative sense here because what the Holy Spirit wants us to see is that it is this mystery, this Babylon the Great, this harlot that has turned the world into a jungle, turned the world into a wilderness. And so the Holy Spirit takes him to a wilderness, and it says, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. And we look at verse 2, and it tells us that the problem that has exploded during this final seven years before Christ returns, exploded on earth, is caused by this woman and her getting the kings of the earth to commit acts of immorality with her so that not only the kings but all who dwell on the earth are made drunk with the wine of her immorality. All right, now we've got to figure out what this part of the figure of speech is, okay? Why is she called a prostitute? Why does God see this as a great, terrible thing that the kings of the earth have prostituted themselves with her and also all the peoples on the earth have committed immorality with her? Sexual immorality is the word. You see, this is a figure of speech that's carefully developed in the Bible, the idea of religious prostitution. In other words, in the spiritual sense, a figure of speech, using the whore as a figure of speech, is a false religious system. And it's saying that the terrible things that develop and come to a head in this tribulation period of seven years were actually caused by this false religious system and the fact that this religious system has drawn all people into participating in her prostitution, her prostitution of truth. Now, let me read you a few verses that bring that out. Hosea chapter 9, verse 1, it says, just write the references down. I'll read them to you, and you can read them later. Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples, for you have played the harlot against your God. You have made love for hire on every threshing floor. Pretty graphic, isn't it? And in the context, it's talking about the fact that it left the truth and begun to follow the false religions around them. Now, Look, and don't look it up. Write it down. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 6. The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the whore. Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 19. Yet she multiplied her harlotry in calling to remembrance the days of her youth, when she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. In every case, this is talking about forsaking the truth of God and following false religion. Now, lest we think only Israel does that, Nahum chapter 3 verse 4 says, and I want to bring in a new dimension to this, all because of the wanton lust of a whore alluring the mistress of sorcery who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. From the multitude of harlotry of the prostitute, goodness of favor, mistress of sorcery, the one who sells the nations with her harlotry and the families with her sorcery. You see, this brings out the fact that and this is, by the way, talking about the last days. 
This is talking about what this scarlet or harlot is going to do in the last days. It brings in the fact that this religious prostitution involves with it sorcery and witchcraft, demons, and that this false religious system will be energized by demons, just as it has been in history. But all of this is going to come to this gigantic head during the final seven years. That's where you're going to find demons involved in deceiving and deception in this religious system that's going to be spread over the whole world. Now, in Psalm 106, verses 36 to 38, it says, And you served their idols, which became a snare to them. And they even sacrificed their son and their daughters to what? Demons. See, they sacrificed their sons and daughters, Israel at one time did, to Baal. And Baal had these big, impressive idols for himself. But behind idols are always demons. And it brings it out clearly here that they didn't sacrifice the idols. They sacrificed the demons, their own children. Now, it says in verse 30, And shed innocent blood in the blood of their sons and their daughters, whom they sacrificed the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with the blood. In Leviticus 17, 7, they shall no longer sacrifice their sacrifices to the goat demons, which they have played with and played the harlot. This shall be a permanent statute to them throughout their generations. So we can see that the idea of harlotry and a, when used figuratively, a prostitute is talking about a false religious system. So when we look at this woman, it is a religious system, and that's part of what it means, the mystery of the woman, okay? All right, now, in verse 4, as we read through here, or I should say verse 3, and he carried me away in the spirit again into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. All right, so we see the woman, and it's the same woman that's explained in verse 18 at the end of the chapter. But the woman is then described as this great whore, Mystery Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And so it says that the woman is riding this scarlet, colored beast. All right, now, who controls where you're going to go when you're riding a horse? The horse or the guy sitting up on top? All right, notice who's riding the beast. It's the prostitute, and she is in control at the beginning. But as we saw in some verses at the end of this chapter, the beast is going to turn on this religious system and destroy it. The beast, the Antichrist, is going to use the system to get into power. But once he gets into power, he and the ten kings with him are going to turn on this prostitute and absolutely destroy her. Now, it says the woman is sitting on a scarlet beast full of blasphemous names. So we see here that both the religious prostitute is a false system and the beast has blasphemous names. This means blasphemous names against the true God written all over it. In other words, it's become a permeated part of this political system, too. And so it says, and having seven heads and ten horns. Verse 4, the woman was clothed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. 
Now, when he sees this woman, he sees her in royal garb. Scarlet and purple were cloths that only the royalty could wear. I mean, in those days, it was very, very expensive. Purple was the most expensive cloth on earth. And only royalty would wear this. And so he describes her as having great wealth and a, a beautiful appearance. On the outside, it looks real. It looks beautiful. And it's decked with all kinds of the most precious jewels on the earth. And it says, having in her hand a gold goblet. So here you see this beautiful woman, and she is dressed as royalty in the most expensive costume. And she is adorned with the most expensive jewels on earth. And she has this beautiful golden goblet. So everything on the outside looks beautiful. But it says, but on the inside of that golden goblet, what? Abominations. Abominations, by the way, are... If something is called an abomination, it means it's beyond regular sin. It means this is something that is especially an affront to God. And it is something that God particularly will judge. Can you think of an abomination that's prominent around this place? Homosexuality is called an abomination in many places in the Bible. I hope I don't get in trouble like I must did. <laughs> God loves them, I love them. But they need to receive the grace of God. God, Jesus died for them. Grace is just as far extended for them, maybe more so than for us. But it's got to be taken. And it's full of unclean things of her immorality. Now, I wanted to look up some words here when I went through here. Unclean things in verse 4 is the word pornias. Pornias. That we get pornography from that word. Porno. Pornias means it's full of the all kinds of obscene sexual acts. Now, you have to realize this is talking figuratively, so it's also talking about the reaching into the depths of this false teaching. And it also says that it's full of the unclean things of her immorality, and the word immorality here is also a word that comes from this porno, porno. And then on, in verse 5 it says, And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery. Now whenever you hear the word in the Bible that something is a mystery, it means this is something really important to listen to and understand. In other words, there are several mysteries that are introduced in the New Testament. And the word musterion is an ancient Greek word it came from the ancient Greek secret fraternities. And there were always musterions for every one of these Greek fraternities. And so looking that up, it's easy to see what is the meaning of this. A mystery, musterion, means something that can only be known by the initiated members but not understood by those that are not. And this is used here in the sense, it's used in the Bible in the sense that a mystery is something that a, a believer in Jesus Christ can understand, but the world cannot. Oh, they can hear the words, they can, you know, they can follow along, but to really understand the meaning and the significance of something is only open to those that are taught by the Holy Spirit. And so it's interesting that he starts off by introducing this woman, really, 
by saying it's a mystery. Something that the angel will have to tell us about in the latter part of the chapter. Something he will explain. So he says, a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Man, what a strong title, huh? Babylon the Great. You see, the Bible always follows a thread on every important truth in the Word of God. It will be introduced in embryonic form in the beginning of the Bible, and it will be traced through, and then it will be brought to full description as we reach the end. Babylon, the plains of Shinar, where Babylon is, and it's where they're doing a lot of the fighting right now, the plains of Shinar in Iraq. That is the place where organized false religion first started. So when he says Babylon, mystery Babylon, it's talking about the fact that false religion as an organized system, started in Babylon on the plains of Shinar. And that this is something that is carried through all of the Gentile powers after that. And as we'll see in a minute, the seven dominant Gentile powers during the times of the Gentiles are going to be introduced here. They are the seven heads. And the mystery of false religion started in Babylon permeated and carried through all of these Gentile powers and will reach its worst in our near future. Man, I see it being set up all the time. There are a lot of denominations in the Christian church that are helping out. They forsook believing the Bible is the word of God a long time ago, many of them. So it says that she is the mother of harlots, harlots being false religious systems, and of the abominations of the earth. In other words, the worst kind of sins. It all came out of here. In verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk, now, up until this time, you know, you can just imagine how John must have felt. Put yourself inviting. They can be very deceptive. This woman is drunk. With all of her beauty, with all of her dazzling apparel and jewelry, she's drunk. But when he sees what's made her drunk, his blood must have run cold because it says the woman is drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. I looked up very carefully this statement. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. Man, is that the most understated translation of, that, of what the Greek says that I've seen in a long time? The word that is translated wonder, the verse, or I should say the verb, is thaumazo, T-H-A-U-M-A-Z-O in English, thaumazo. And so I looked it up, and this is what the best Greek lexicon had to say about it. It says, it's a word that means to wonder, to marvel, to be dazzled and astonished, and the context determines whether it is in a good sense or a bad sense. In other words, you can be dazzled by something bad, and so the context has to tell you. And this is the way. In the Greek, there's a verb. Thamazo is a verb, thamazo. And then there is a descriptive noun, thaumai, which is the same root, same word. And so it literally says, I was absolutely dazzled and astonished 
with a great amazement. Because that brings in the last statement, the prepositional description. And this is the way the best Greek minds translated it. They said, when I saw her, I wondered in great amazement. John just couldn't, it was hard to process. It was overwhelming to see this thing and to see that with all of this outward attractiveness, with all of this outward power and beauty and its deceptive appearance, that inside there was something so pernicious and so evil that you could hardly see the two put together. So he was just dumbfounded. And that's when the mystery is begun to be approached. The angel in verse 7 says, The angel said to me, Why are you so amazed? Literally. Why do you wonder? Why are you so amazed? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. So you see, he says, I'm going to tell you what it means. Don't be amazed. Don't be astonished. I'm going to tell you what it means. All right, so in verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go into destruction. And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and yet will come. So he says the beast, that's the first thing he focuses on. The thing that is astonishing and that is a mystery is that it was, it is not right now to us, and yet it will rise again. It will be. So this beast is a mystery because it appears to die. It appears to be gone. And then, at the appropriate time, it will be raised into life again. Now, this is true of both the political system and the great leader who will lead it. Both of them are raised from the dead political system is going to suddenly be miraculously raised from the death of history. And the man who runs it will be brought back from the dead from a mortal head wound. So he introduces that idea there. Now, in verse 9, he begins the interpretation of these. I call this, I love a mystery. Verse 9. Here is the mind that has wisdom. Now, when the scripture uses a statement like that, it's kind of like Jesus saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he who has eyes to see, let him see. Because when it says the one who has the mind that has wisdom, it's talking about a human mind that is being taught by the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't give you two cents for a Ph.D. who's taught only by man. To me, it's just piling it higher and deeper. But if you want real wisdom, it's not to discredit education, you know. But the greatest wisdom, wisdom is the ability to take what you know and apply it. The greatest wisdom comes when the Holy Spirit teaches you from God's Word, and he teaches you the meaning of things, okay? So he says, okay, he who has ears to hear and a mind that's open to the Holy Spirit to teach, here's what it means. Explanation number one, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And I've told you about my experience as a young believer in Houston where I was, for the first time, going through the book of Revelation with Colonel Bob Thiem, Bracket Church. 
and I was uh, I was so excited I was like running on air and we had gotten to the 17th chapter and he gave us some questions to answer and at lunch break was working in downtown Houston at lunch break I was out walking around and I came by the old Rice Hotel and the Pan American Airways ticket office was there and I was pondering this very thing what are the seven mountains and there was a big travel poster there saying come visit the ancient city of the seven hills grazie mille <laughs> rome and there's no question about it now there are other cities that have seven mountains by the way istanbul is built on seven mountains or seven hills but the ancient city of Rome is well known for it. All right, so that's the first thing. That gives us a geographical clue about that. And now, in verse 10, and they are also, in the Greek it emphasizes the word also, and I'm amazed that some translations do not bring out the word also. And they are also seven kingdoms, so he says, not only is the, the seven heads symbolic of seven mountains, but it's also symbolic of seven kingdoms. Now, he says, five have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when it comes, it must remain a little while. All right. Remember what I said, that this is talking about the times of the Gentiles and the seven dominant great empires of the times of the Gentiles. And they're selected particularly because they had an impact and effect on the nation of Israel. Now you look in history, and it's easy to find those seven empires, or at least six right now because the seventh hadn't come. But it's easy to find the six. Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece. Those were the five that had fallen. One is what empire followed Greece? Rome. Daniel tells you all about this. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation are really woven together, interlaced. Now, it says the other has not yet come. And when it comes, it must remain a little while. Okay. Now, this gets us back to the mystery of this final stage of the beast with the ten horns because it says that there's a mystery about the final stage of this pageantry of world empires. The seventh kingdom, it was, it is not now, and yet it's going to come. This is the revival of the ancient Roman Empire. And it is revived in the form of ten nations that will become dominant just before the time the Antichrist appears. And the Antichrist is introduced and in how he relates to this next. It says, that was the second explanation about the seven kingdoms. Now the third explanation, the beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and yet is one of the seven. He leads it to destruction, literally, okay? So what we have here is that it's saying that this, this sixth empire was, is not, and yet it's going to come up again and become a seventh form of it. And yet it says it must remain for a little while. That means it won't have great power at first. But then 
there is another part of this beast that comes up. And it says, he will be an eighth, yet out of the seven. You see, this beast is the man who's going to run it. This is the Roman Antichrist. This is the man who's going to come. He's going to take over those ten nations, and he's going to use it as his political platform to gain control of the world. But more than the political, he's going to use the great whore to really get control. So you see, it's both a political system, that's what we're talking about here, and the harlot is the religious system. He uses both of them to gain control of the people. Now, in verse 12, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. That is a short time during the tribulation. These have one purpose, and they give their power and authority to the beast. And that's the Roman Antichrist. Verse 14, these will wage war against the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, because he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. So we know that this is talking about the fact they wage war with the lamb. They're going to wage war against him and his followers that become believers during this period. And there's going to be a wholesale slaughter of believers. And I have seen evidence of that kind of hatred in some parts of the world today. I mean, the slaughter that goes on around the Sudan and in that area, Eritrea, always hard for me to pronounce. That is a place where it's basically Muslims against Christians, and they wiped out about probably more like 10 million. So that's only a small preview of what's coming. Those who believe during the tribulation, after we're gone, are they're going to have to pay a heavy price to be a believer. Today, being an outspoken Christian may get you criticized or ostracized, but you're usually not going to have your head cut off. They will. So why not be one now when it's not so hard? All right, this is the fifth explanation. And he said to me, the waters, remember that was a symbol in the first part. The woman was sitting on many waters, it says. The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So this is a system. It shows that the religious system is something that would be in power all during the, the history from back there to now. Did you notice that? It is the political system that was, is not, and shall be. But not the religious system. It says the religious system develops all during this interim from the time he wrote the book of Revelation right up until today. So it shouldn't be a big mystery as to what system we're talking about. But we really have to be careful to make a sharp distinction between the system and the people who are in it. Because there are a lot of people in the system that by the grace of God have come to know Jesus Christ as personal Savior and are born again. So you can never separate the wheat from the tares. Jesus said, you leave that job to me. But the system is a whore. The system burned at stake. Thousands and thousands of true believers for the great crime of translating the scriptures into their own language. Drunk with the blood of the saints. Many believers were put on racks and tortured during the inquisitions for the crime of not going along with some of the things that were taught. Let's read on. 
And the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the harlot, and will make her desolate and naked, and will eat her flesh, and will burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose, and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. All right, now, that's something that I must admit, first several times I studied the book of Revelation, I failed to factor in what that said. The Antichrist himself is going to destroy this religious system. Now, why? Because he's going to declare himself to be God. See? He doesn't have any use for this system anymore after he goes into the temple in the middle of the seven-year tribulation and he declares himself to be God in the Holy of Holies of the temple. And that's when all hell breaks loose, literally. But he and the ten kings that brought him in are going to have one purpose, and that's to destroy the system and get it out of the way. Verse 18, and the woman. Now, you got to go back and catch up everything that's been said in this chapter. The woman is who? Babylon the Great, the mother of all harlots and abominations of the earth. The woman is the whore of Babylon, the religious system. The one who became the recipient of what was track through all of these different successive Gentile empires. And the false religious systems just kept getting more refined as they went through. And now, mystery Babylon, the harlot, is this woman. And so remember that when it says, and the woman whom you saw is, present tense, in other words, it's in John's day. The woman whom you saw is the great city, which in present tense in the Greek again, is reigning over the kings of the earth. There's only one city that could be. When John wrote the book of Revelation, the Caesars of Rome ruled the known world. It's Rome specifically a part of Rome that is a religious system. And you can see when the political Roman Empire fell apart in around the 5th century and ceased to be, the religious Roman Empire continued. And it says the kings of the earth committed fornication with their community. The kings were all crowned by the Pope. And all kinds of shenanigans were done. You ought to watch on the television a series called The Tudors. Pretty raunchy, but it does give some pretty good history. But it shows how the cardinals were so involved in the politics and everything else. It, it's, it's pretty accurate. Now, I'm not trying to drum up something here, am I? I'm simply trying to teach the scripture. I'm not trying to bring anger at anybody or anything else. I love a lot of priests I know and love and know they're born again. I remember when I was in the 70s, when I was on the constant speaking circuit with all the books I had out there, Malachi Martin, they would always bring us on the same show and we'd sit there in the green room, and they'd be trying to pit us against each other, and we'd be sitting there laughing. And I said, like, Malachi, I can't see a thing wrong with you. I'm not going to argue with you. He said, I'm not, I like you. I'm not going to argue with you. So we'd have a big love fest out there on the set. <laughs> the guys would be all frustrated because they wanted us to argue. Nothing to argue about. The guy was a believer. What I'm trying to say is there's always a difference between a system and the people. You must always keep that. God is the one that will judge the system. We're not supposed to. But we should be with a mind that has wisdom, too. Thank God. 
that through all of the deception of Satan and the times that he tries to blind each one of us in this life, that we've come through all of that, we've come to be believers in Jesus Christ. You know what a miracle that is? I mean, the Bible talks about the fact that one of the things that the world's going to rejoice about, Jesus takes Satan and binds him and says, he who deceived all the nations has been bound. Well, he's the deceiver. His name means that. And with all of the apparatus he has to use to deceive people and keep us from the truth, that blessed are your ears because you heard it. Blessed is your mind because you received Jesus Christ and received the gift of pardon that he gave his life in our place to purchase for us. And I'm thankful that through prophecy, we have a good outline and guideline of just where history is going right now. I mean, I'm so thankful as I look at a lot of world situations today, and I see it's, in many cases, hopeless. I'm glad I know the end of the book. I know where it's going. I know where I'm going, more importantly. And I know that there's only one thing that we really need to be doing, and that's bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ and, and helping people to grow in faith. Keep that in perspective when you look at some of these things. But I can surely see things developing to focus toward what the Bible predicts is going to be the world conditions. I mean, you look at the Middle East right now and what's happening right now. It's like Ezekiel 2,600 years ago wrote the script for them to follow, and they're following it unwittingly right to the letter. So you see all of these things happening, but you don't have to be in despair. You don't have to be afraid. We know this is soon going to come to the point where Jesus is going to say, Come up here! And before he gets to the end of that little phrase, you'll be looking at him face to face. And that's something we can look forward to very soon. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for having such an attentive audience. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, for the Holy Spirit watching over us as we went through this chapter. And I pray that we might learn these things, that the Holy Spirit will apply the significance of it to us, especially that your word is truth, and that we look at this and we know you were the author. May we incorporate your word in everything we do daily. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.